You have your Bibles this morning. Turn with me to the gospel once again, the gospel of St. Matthew. We're going to continue on with our study of the Sermon on the Mount. The sixth chapter, beginning in verse number five. But before I read my text, I want to just make a couple of remarks If you will allow me to do so, it will take just a few moments. But maybe some of you have saw that you've seen it over the news, but a few days ago, um, and I'm going to say this kindly, but also um, maybe a little sarcastically, our illustrious vice president was at a rally talking about and extolling the virtues of abortion. Whenever a man in the crowd yelled out, Jesus is Lord, and she turned around mockingly and said, oh, you're at the wrong rally. Church, that's what she thinks of Christians. Let let me be blunt. She hates you. She does not like you. She can care less for you. And any Christian so-called that says, I'll vote for her. Any pastor that goes over television saying, well, I'm with her. I question your salvation, sir. Let's be real. Once again, she hates Christians. Her party, her party's platform is abortion, killing babies. Do you want to be associated with that? Her party is changing men into women. Do you want to be associated with that? So why are you voting for her? Ladies and gentlemen, this election is too important. And I want to talk to those Christians that said that they're not going to vote. When you say that you're not going to vote, you are voting. You're voting for the enemy. When you say that I refuse or abstain my vote, you are voting for abortion without voting. You're voting for LGBTQ without voting. And you're voting for transgenderism without voting. Your vote is too important for you to pass up. You need to let your voice be heard. And it's time that the church stands up and become the church. And we're removing our head from out of the sand and saying we're going to stand up for what's right. And we're going to stand up for biblical principles. All right, I'm done. (laughs) Think about it, church. That's what she thinks of you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus said, and when you pray... You shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, where they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not you therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you need of before you ask Him. And this morning we're going to be dealing with, once again, what is your motive? Two weeks ago we dealt with what is your motive for giving? Today, we're going to be dealing, what is your motive for praying? 
What is your motive for praying? Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus, and we come before you humbly, asking your help, your leading, your guidance, and for your anointing. Anoint our ears to hear what you would have us to say, and we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. There are two things, two aspects of Christianity that are extremely vital for every Christian and every Christian's growth. That is the study of God's Word, and that is prayer. These two aspects of Christianity, I'm afraid, are lost arts today. There are more Christians sitting in the pews of churches around the country probably than ever before, but there are less individuals actually praying and reading their Bible. There was a study that came about some time back, and I believe it was through the organization called Barna. And they said that there are trying to remember the exact number, but about 30 to 40% of all Christians that label themselves as Christians in America attend church only once a month. And yet there's more Christians who say that they only read their Bible at least once a month. The travesty is that as Christians... We don't know where we're going because we don't know where we've been. And when we fail to take advantage of what God has given us through His Word and through a communication with Him, then we're missing out on some of the greatest blessings that any Christian could ever have. The study of God's Word is so important that the psalmist would say, not only do I read it, but I hide it in my heart every every single day. I... I I, I have it on my heart. I extol the praises of God and I make sure that I meditate on His Word every day. But at the same time, when it comes to prayer, I'm afraid that that too is a lost art. I'm going to say something right now that it may, I don't know, you may not agree with it. But I'll just say it because I believe that what I'm going to say is right. If we truly took prayer as important as it should be, then every Saturday morning this place would be full. Seeking the face of God every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 or from 10 to 11. Seeking the presence of God to be in the church service on Sunday morning. If we really took prayer seriously, then we would always carve out some time without our, within our busy day to say, Lord, I am shutting everyone else out and I am coming into your presence to seek your face. If we really took prayer seriously, then we would not be in the condition as a nation that we're in. If we took prayer seriously, then I feel that we would see more moves of God within this country than what we've ever seen before. Because mark my words, when we go into scripture and we look at church history, just about every major move of God began when people returned to praying. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land and then will I forgive their sin. Honey, we've got to have all those things. But in order to have it, we've got to come back to praying before God. We've got to come back to having that serious attitude of having a prayer life before God. Corporately, And privately. I believe that when a church begins to pray, things happen. 
Oh, I wish I had somebody that would understand that. I believe when a church returns to prayer, things begin to happen. Oh, I'm going to say it one more time. When the church returns to prayer, things begin to happen. Prayer is one of the greatest assets that we as believers have. Prayer is simply communicating with God. It's talking with God. It's having a relationship with God. And you've heard this question asked any number of times throughout the last several years, but what good is a relationship when there's no communication? Look at your spouse. Do me a favor. Run an experiment. Maybe. Why don't you go for a week without talking to your spouse and see what happens? Some of your spouses may say, oh, thank God, please, yes. But if you want to erode a relationship, stop talking. If you want to cancel a relationship, stop talking. If you want to move forward with dissolving a relationship, stop talking. Prayer is you talking to God. It's communion with God. It's you having a relationship with God. And children of God, understand this. God wants you to talk to Him. He wants you to converse with Him. He wants you to come before Him. He desires that you speak with Him. He wants a relationship with you. Do you want a relationship with Him? And when I speak of prayer, I'm not referring to, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. Our Lord, I pray that you'd bless this food and nurse to our bodies in Jesus' name. I heard one of my friends said this. He said, I, I just said one prayer and said, Lord, bless all the meals for the rest of my life. I looked at him. I said, I don't think that's going to work. He said, well, it's worked so far. I said, I think you need to revisit that one. <laughs> it's one of the most crucial things that any believer has at their disposal. But do you know that there are times that whenever you begin to have that conversation or communication with God, that sometimes you can pray wrong? Don't you know that sometimes that whenever you pray, your words will go no further than just out of your mouth and into your ears? Jesus tells his disciples and explains to us today that there is a wrong way to pray and then there is a right way to pray. Now this little message, yes, we're dealing with the motive of prayer and then the following, I think it is in two weeks, we're going to be dealing with what does it mean to pray and how should we pray using the model prayer that's found in the preceding verses. But today, Jesus is wanting us to realize and understand that there is, just as was a motive for giving, there is a motive for prayer as well. And he is telling us that you can pray wrong and you can pray right. So I want us to look at it today for a moment. How can we pray wrong? Jesus gives us two striking examples of how we can pray wrong. The first example that he uses is he uses the, uh, the religious aristocracy, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Their prayers were known to be very mechanical, very lengthy, very selfish, and very ostentatious. And he presents this type of prayer as the first example as to how not to pray. He said the religious leaders, and I'm paraphrasing in verse number 5, he said the religious leaders will stand on the street corner and they will begin to open their mouths in front of everyone to pray very loudly. In other words, he is saying that these individuals were so holy and so righteous that they could not wait to get to the temple. They wanted just to stand on the street corner in front of everyone and begin to pray. 
And then when they would get into the synagogue, they would always find the most prominent place in the synagogue. And then they were, there they would stand and they would pray. And the whole issue is this. Jesus said, that type of prayer, I don't hear. Our God the Father does not hear. Why? Because it is selfish. It is a selfish type of prayer. Hey, look at me. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago as we were dealing with giving that there are those that have the wrong motive when they give. Hey, look at what I am doing. Look at how much I am giving. Look at what I am and who I am helping. He is using that same idea, but this time for prayer. He he was saying that these religious individuals were so centered upon themselves that they wanted everyone around them to know how holy and righteous that they were. In other words, that the moment that they were begin to pray, they were not really praying to God. They were praying for themselves. They were praying so they can be seen and they can be heard. Some people, that's exactly what they do. When they come to a prayer meeting, they want, and I'm not saying anybody does it here on Saturdays because I haven't seen that. But there are people that do come to prayer meetings only because they want to be seen by people. They arrive to prayer meetings and they begin to pray very loudly as a selfish manner to say, look at me. Look at what I am doing. Look at what I am saying. Jesus says, don't pray like the hypocrite. He didn't say just don't pray like the religious leaders. He said, don't pray like the hypocrite. Do you remember remember what a hypocrite was? A hypocrite was someone that wears a mask. An actor. Someone that is playing a part. He is disingenuous. That's not who they really are. When you think of an actor, you think of Hollywood. You've got a lot of people that have made a lot of money playing characters. And every movie, they've got a different character that they are playing. That is the definition and textbook definition of a hypocrite. You are playing someone else. You are not yourself. And Jesus says these type of people are hypocrites. Their their main concern, ladies and gentlemen, is making sure people see them. And making sure people hear them. Now I want to ask this question. Is it wrong to pray publicly? No. No. Even though that there have been some that take this scripture and take this passage literally and will say, well, Jesus says that you, you don't, you shouldn't pray in public. You need to go into a closet somewhere and you need to get along with God. Therefore, we should not have public prayer meetings. No, that's not really what that means at all. God desires throughout scripture we see his people coming together and praying. Throughout history we see that when great moves of God happen it's when people gather together and they begin to seek the face of God corporately. There's nothing against public prayer. The issue is what is your motive? Is your motive because you want to be seen by people or is your motive I want to hear from God? And you see, Jesus says that the individuals that are ostentatious in their prayer, they will have their reward. Their reward is not coming from a blessing from God. Their reward is being heard and seen by men. And y'all, that is a very sad reward. So the first thing he tells us regarding our motive to prayer is, are you praying to be seen by people? Are you praying to be heard by people?
But then he also gives us a second area as to how we are not to pray. And I want you to go down to verse 7. I know I hear, I hear that crying. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying. See, I'm telling you. They're saying, please just stop. I'm kidding. Verse 7, Jesus says, but when you pray, so first of all, we're not to pray to be seen and we're not to pray to be heard. And he's using the religious leaders at that time frame to do that. Then he switches gears and he says in verse 7, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen. So first of all, he tells us, don't pray like the Pharisees. They're long, mechanical, very ostentatious prayer. But then he also says, don't pray like the heathen. You know what the heathen does? The heathen uses vain repetitions. They say the same thing over and over and over, thinking that their repetition is going to cause their God to move. Do we have any scripture for that? Go to Acts 19. I'm going to ask them to put it on the screen. And I gave it to them before I made my decision. I said, yes, I'm going to make sure I give it to them early. Acts chapter 19. Talking about vain repetition. Verse 23. This is the city of Ephesus. Paul was ministering. And there were people that became enraged because of his ministry. And the scripture says in verse 23, In the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost all throughout Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great god Diana, our great goddess Diana, should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. Now skip down. To verse 34. Talking about vain repetition. So that you get the picture. Paul is preaching. Revival is happening in the, in, in, the, in the area of Ephesus. And you have Demetrius who has made his living making gods. And selling gods. And their businesses has come to a halt. Because people are being saved. And he is turning around to other silversmith. And saying we're all going broke fellas. The gods that we have been making with our hands, we're all going broke. Nobody's buying it. And then you have these individuals in verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, speaking of Alexander in the previous verse, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. For two hours, repetition. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, let me ask you a question. What if we came here to church on Sunday morning and instead of the going through the normal progression of praise and worship, announcements, choir, prayer for the sick at times, special offering, papal, and preaching. Instead of going through that routine, what if either dad or myself or maybe both of us came out here at 10 o'clock and just started chanting, Great is Mike the Tiger of LSU! For two hours. From 10 to 12. I can tell you what would happen. Y'all would look at us and say, Get off the stage, go back to prayer, and you need to get right with God. Or Mimi might grab us both by the neck and drag us off. One of the two. But repetition repetitious praying. They were saying, great is Diana of the Ephesian. Great is Diana of the Ephesian. Great is Diana of the... For two solid hours. Do you know how annoying that would get? Thinking that is going to cause something or to do something. 
But there's another one in the Old Testament, and this is even int- more interesting than the first one. Do you all remember Mount Carmel? The prophet Elijah? The showdown at Carmel. 400 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of the grove against one prophet of God. And he tells all of them, let's go to Mount Carmel and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And he tells them, y'all start. And for a period of time, all they did is their vain repetition of, oh Baal, hear us. Oh Baal, hear us. Oh Baal, hear us. Oh Baal, hear us. To the point where they started to cut themselves because nothing was happening. They were trying to conjure up something and tradition tells us that as they built that altar to the the, the God of Baal. That someone would crawl in and light a fire, trickery, to show that God. Baal is God. But tradition tells us that as they were building this this altar to Baal and someone crawled underneath it, that they suffocated. And as they were crying out, they were saying, where is he? He should be doing this by now. What's going on? And for a period of time, as they were crying out to Baal, thinking that the more they cry and the more they cut, Baal would hear them. What does the prophet Elijah do? The scripture says he mocks him and says, maybe he's not hearing you. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's not. You got to scream all the louder. And I'm going to be very crude here. Very crude. And I'm going to be the best way possible. In the Hebrew, as he is speaking, he is telling them, maybe your God is in the restroom. And he is not hearing you. So call him all the louder. You see what I'm trying to get at is that he is telling Christians, don't pray ostentatiously. Don't pray where everyone can see you and everyone can hear you because you're going to get your reward. But also stay away from vain repetitions. Thinking that the more you say it, I'm going to work. Now, there is a truth to claiming something and getting before God and speaking something by faith, believing for something to happen. We've been praying for the same thing for probably close to 70 years, and that is the entirety of this world. But we're not doing it in such a way where we're saying the more we say it, we think God's going to get up and do something. It is not vain repetition. So he's trying to tell us you have two wrong ways of praying. To be seen and to be heard. Or you're trying to do it in a way where it's quantity over quality. Saying something over and over and over and over. Thinking the more you say it, God will get up from his throne and do something. First of all, God's not deaf. You don't have to scream his name. Now, sometimes you might have to. <laughs> but then Jesus says, there is a right way to come before me or come before the Father. And he says this, go into a closet, shut the door, lock the door, and be alone with the Father. Now, this doesn't mean, once once again, that God is, or that Jesus is putting a kibosh on public prayer meetings. No. What he is saying is this, and he's not taking this, we should not take this at times literally. What he is saying is this, it's not about being seen by people, but the moment that you come into the presence of God, you shut everyone else out, 
and you realize that you're not praying for them and you're not praying for yourself, you are praying to him. That when you come into his presence, that you realize that you are coming into the presence of a thrice holy God. You are coming into the presence of the Almighty. You are coming into the presence of a great God. You are coming into the presence of the one and the only God. And that when we come into his presence, we should do so in reverence, humility, but also with faith. That when we are in his presence, we realize that we are in an audience chamber of one. That we're not doing this, I don't pray because I want you to hear me. I pray because I want to be in a relationship with my heavenly father. When I pray, I don't care about what you hear me. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for a show. And I'm not here to be heard, to be seen, or to be repetitive. But I am in here because I want to know who God is. I want to seek Him because I want to know Him. That when I come into His presence, that I want to sense Him. That I want to feel Him. That I want to hear His that still, small voice. When I don't know what else to do. And I don't know where else to go. And I don't know who else to, to, to talk to or to believe. Yet He will sit there and tell me what I need to do. Where I need to go. And who I need to listen to. It's in these quiet moments. That when we come together. That we shut everything else out. And we get into the presence of God. And say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. My whole goal in life is to know you. My whole goal in life is to know who you are. My whole goal in life is to know who and what you are. Not so much we don't pray because of what we can get from God. We pray because we want to know him. When we seek him, we don't seek him for what we can get for him. But we seek him for who and what he is. I want you to get that church. We don't seek Him to get things. We seek Him to know Him. We sing that old song, and I, I don't quite all remember all the lyrics at times, but we've been singing it for 30 years, I guess. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to hear you speak. I want to know you more. They say, in the stillness, in the quiet place, in the stillness, I know that you are there. This is when we pray. We're talking about intimacy. We're talking about relationship. Church, when you come to into the presence of God and you want to be seen by people, God does not hear you. People around you do, but God does not hear you. Because he knows your motive is only to be seen and heard. You see, some people may look at this text and we say, well, we point out the hypocrite, we point out the heathen. Jesus is not saying that I'm showing you this To point them out, I'm showing you this because some of you do this. He's trying to examine, he wants us to examine our hearts. And as we get before the Lord, we've got to ask ourselves, are we doing this to be seen and heard? Or are we doing this to know him? R.A. Torrey made this statement. He said, We should never utter one syllable of prayer, either public or private, until we are definitely conscious that we have come into the presence of God and are actually praying to Him. We're talking about motive. We're talking about your heart. We're asking the question to us, to ourselves are we doing this to be seen and heard 
are we doing this because I want to know him? Prayer is all about him. It's not about you. Let me help you. Nothing that we do is about us. Nothing that we do should ever be about us. When we make it about us, we are not making it about God. And when it comes to our prayer life, just as it is with our giving, and we're going to see in a few weeks, even when it comes to our fasting, the question must be, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because I want to know him? He tells us to exclude everyone. He tells us to remove ourselves from everyone spiritually and say, I'm walking into the presence and the holiness of God. And there are times, church, whenever you realize that you're walking into the presence of God, that you can't speak. That all you do is weep. Because of how holy and righteous that he is. I can tell you there have been times when I've walked into these prayer meetings. And I have felt in all honesty the weight of the world on my shoulders. Nowhere near compared to what my grandparents have faced and are facing every day. But I understand to an extent of the pressure of what it means to be a part of something like this where your mind, you're consumed with all of this. You're consumed, at least I am consumed, about making sure that we're doing things right. And you're always thinking you can't sleep at night because you're thinking about what we need to do here, what we need to do here. My mind is on you. My mind is upon what we're doing here, the network, my schooling, the college. my It's all encompassing. And there have been times when I've walked into a prayer meeting And I walk over to my spot over here. And the moment I kneel down, I just begin to say, Lord, I come into your presence. And when that happens, the the Spirit of God begins to fill my soul. And all I do is sit there and weep for a few moments because I can't speak. Because I'm in the presence of God. And the good thing about this church is when you come into the presence of God, He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to come to Him. He wants you to come into His presence. He wants you to talk to Him. He wants you to converse with Him. He wants you to ask Him for the world. He wants you to ask Him for the impossible. He wants you to lay your heart out before Him because He loves you. He loves you. Look, I'm a parent. How many parents do we have here? I can tell you this as a parent. My wife and I, when we were on our vacation a few days ago, we were sitting in a restaurant and we were talking about this exact thing. How that as parents, we want all of our daughters to come to us for everything. And I have to be honest with you. That's when I looked at her and I said, well, honey, they're daughters. There are some things when they come to me, I'm going to say, you need to go see your mom. Because I'm a guy. I don't know anything about it. But at the same time, as a parent, we want our daughters to come to us. We want our daughters to come and talk to us about everything. We want our daughters to be open with us. We want our daughters not to hide anything from us. We want our daughters from Samantha, Abby, Carolina, McKenzie. McKenzie, she's just too concerned about dinosaurs right now. So, you know, it's all good. But we want the others. We want them all to come to, come to us and to lay their hearts out before us. We want them to come and ask us for things, even though we know the answer is going to be no. We still want them to ask us. If that is us as parents, how much more does our Heavenly Father want us to come to Him in the exact same manner? 
How much more? Come on, church. How much more does our Heavenly Father want us to come to Him and ask Him for things, even though the answer might be no? He still wants us to come into His presence. He still wants us to ask Him for great and mighty things. He still wants us to believe Him for the impossible. He wants us to come into His presence to say, Lord, I love you. I thank you for all that you've done for us. He desires that for us. And church, yes, we come before Him and we ask Him for things. But know this, He knows what we need even before we even ask. He knows what we need even before we ask. He knows what we need. And yet, He still wants us to come before Him and ask Him. Glory to God. Church, are you getting this? He desires that we come to Him on a daily basis. Why? Because He is our Heavenly Father. He is our Great Shepherd. And He desires to provide for His children. Think about this for a second, church. He desires to bless you more than you even asking for a blessing. Oh, come on now. He wants to bless you so much that he says, I'll bless, even if you don't ask me, I'll still bless you. He wants to bless his children. He wants to work in your life, but he can't do it if you don't spend time with him. I go back to my original analogy a few minutes ago. You're in a relationship with God. But for how many, it's only a one-sided relationship where He loves you and He blesses you. But you don't return the favor and come before Him and talk to Him. He wants you. And He doesn't want you just to reserve it on Sundays. He wants to hear it every day. He wants you to wake up in the morning with these words coming out of your mouth. Lord, I thank you for giving me another morning. I thank you for putting a roof over my head. I thank you, Lord, that I can get up and go do a job that you have provided for me. I thank you that you've given me a family that loves me and I love them. I'm grateful that you have given me all the things that I could ever ask or need or even that I even want. I thank you for blessing me. And Lord, I'm asking as I come into your presence, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me for anything that I've ever done wrong. And Lord, I come before you thanking you. And here's my needs. Lord, this is what I need for this day. Guess what? He desires that. He desires that. He wants that. He wants you to come before Him daily. That's why the Scripture tells us so many times over that our praise should ever be, or His praise should ever be upon our lips, that even we are to pray without ceasing, pray without stopping every day. Have that prayer within your heart. Lord, help me. Lord, bless me. Lord, I thank you. I pray. Whatever it is, God desires that from you. And if He desires that from us, That should put something in our hearts to say, Lord, you've done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. And I desire to come into your presence to know you. That's it. That's what he wants for you to come into his presence because he wants you to get to know him. Listen, he knows you already. He knows everything about you. He created you. He knows the hairs that are upon your head or the lack thereof. He knows the hairs that are used to be on your hair, that on your head, and now they're in your ears. He knows everything about you. He created you. 
He created you. And yet he desires to have a living, breathing relationship with you. So I'll go back to my question. When you pray, do you do it to be seen? Do you do it to be heard? Or do you because you follow a regimen? Listen, let me tell you, let me just talk about this for a moment. Every one of us should pray every day. But when we are more concerned about meeting that criteria than being in the presence of God, our prayers go no further than from our mouth to our ears, and that's it. When we are more concerned about checking the box off and saying, well, I prayed for 30 minutes today, that doesn't work. It's not about quantity. It's about your quality. Quality over quantity. Look, you may go throughout your day and you may realize that I only have a short amount of time to seek God and you make the most of it. God would rather you do that than spend an hour and you say nothing. Even though your mouth is moving, your heart and your head is standing still. He would much rather you be in his presence for just a short amount of time than you get down on your knees for a solid hour and do nothing. Where you think you're saying something, but you're going back to either ostentatious prayer, selfish prayer, or you're in vain repetition. God desires to have a relationship with you question to you is do you want to have a relationship with him if you do realize that when I pray I'm coming into the presence of God that it's my job to focus on him and eliminate everything and everyone else that this should not matter to anyone else but this is my time with God he is holy he is righteous And he desires to hear from me. And I want to hear and I need to hear from him. Let your relationship be a two-way street where your prayers go up and his answers come down. And your prayers go up and your answer comes down. The prayers go up and the blessings come down. That's what he wants to do you he knows you but do you want to know him and if you want to know him tonight or this morning you can start right now you don't have to wait some of you may say well you know I'm not I'm not that spiritually right to pray he doesn't care if you just start with and say Lord you know who I am You know what I'm doing, and I need your help. Guess what? That's the type of prayer he wants to hear from you. Lord, I need your help. Some people may say, well, you know, i I got to give up my nicotine before I can really start. No, he's saying you need to pray right now because I can help you get off nicotine. I can help you get off drugs. I can help you get off alcohol. Whatever it is, just come to me. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know you. Lord, I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. Lord, I want to know you more. I want to ask our singers and musicians to come back, please. And I want to ask them to sing that little chorus, I want to know you. And I want you to do it in a very slow rhythm if you can, please. Because that should be our prayer. That when we come into his presence, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to be in your presence. I want to hear you speak to me. I want to see you face to face. And I want to be in your presence. Lord, I want to know you. Could you stand? 
could you stand all across this auditorium this morning? Go ahead and sing it, please. Come on right now. And I want you just for a moment, if you want to make this your prayer today, I want you to come out of your seat this morning and I want you to come walk around this front. And I want you to make this your faith declaration of saying, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. It's time to get into his presence, church. It's time to develop that relationship with him. Say, Lord, I want to know you. Come on, one more time. One more time, I want to know you. Come on, as close as you can. Just slip up your hands right now, church, and let's just say, Lord, my prayer is I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. the secret. This is what it's all about in the secret. In the secret. And in the quiet place. In that stillness. In the stillness. Lord, you are there. In the secret. In the quiet. In the quiet hour. Wait on me. I want to know you. Come on right now, let's sing it. I want to know you. I know you know it. Make it your prayer this morning. I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. Lord, I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to see your face. I want to love you. Come on, one more time, one more time, please. I want to know you, Lord. I want to love you. I want to hear you. Yes, I do. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to love you. Just one more time, that verse, please. In the stillness, in the secret place. In the secret, in the quiet place. Lord, I know you're there. Entering into his presence. In the quiet hour I wait. Only for you. I want to know. Now before we dismiss, let's sing it one more time all across this auditorium. Make it your prayer this morning. I want to know you. I want to hear you. I want to hear your voice. Every one of us, this is what he desires from you, from me. He wants us to say, Lord, I want to know you more and more and more and more. 
And when you come into his presence, understand you come not through your good works, not through your own merit, but you come to the Father through Jesus Christ because of what he's done for us at Calvary's cross. That because of the blood of Jesus that I can come boldly into the throne room of grace. That through the shed blood of Jesus that I can have a relationship with my heavenly father. And through the shed blood of Jesus I can hear his voice and I can sense his presence. And when you come into your, to his presence, come in by faith. Believing that God is going to meet your need. Make this song your prayer, church. And I want you to leave here this morning and say, Lord, my prayer is I want to know you. This is not, I don't pray to be seen or heard, but I pray because I want to know you. I want that relationship with you. Turn around, tell your neighbor you love them. Be back with us tonight. Six o'clock, don't miss it. Missionary Cody Barbier will be with us. You don't want to miss it. We love you. God bless you. We hope you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. 
Family Worship Center located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call one 800 288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.